Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I will be talking about Android 10. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO73. So, another year, another release of Android. This latest version you may notice is just called Android 10. It no longer has a cute dessert name associated with it. Um, We would have had uh, a dessert starting with the letter Q this year, so I'm just going to go ahead and name this uh, Android Quiche um, because I have uh, a a funny quiche story that happened to me. Um, So go go and listen to The Fringe if you want to hear that story. Uh, But here on Second Opinion, we're just interested in uh, talking about Android. So let's get right into it. Um, first of all, we've got quite a few devices that are actually getting updated to Android 10, uh, right away. Um, in particular, the Pixel 1 is, uh, getting updated, which I'm very excited for because when they released the Pixel 1, they only, uh, promised, I believe it was, uh, two years of major Android releases. Uh, It's now a three-year-old device and uh, Google is still updating it. So kudos on that, Google. Um, And there's also a lot of like third-party companies who are coming out with uh, day one updates. Um, So that's uh, Project Trouble from, I think that was two years ago and Android 8 uh, is uh, paying dividends now. So let's talk about some of those new features that everybody is interested in hearing about. First of all, dark mode. Oh my goodness. We've been asking for this for years. And it's been like teased a couple of times. Google introduced some like dark modes in a couple of like the beta versions of older version of uh, older releases of Android, but it never actually made it into uh, the production version. Um, but it's here, it's finally here, we have it. Um, so when you activate the dark theme, uh, it changes all of the system apps, right? So like settings and, gosh, that's like the only system app, isn't there? Um, the notification drawer, all of the quick settings, right? It's all, dark background with light text. And also, the operating system commands all third-party apps to use a dark theme if they have one. So this requires, for one, that the app developer has to have built a dark theme for their app, uh, and also they have to have updated their app to look for that API, right? So they have to uh, be targeting like the latest version of Android for that for that uh, you know one switch toggle to work. I'm really happy with the fact that this dark mode is indeed like a pure black when you're looking at the notification drawer and all the system settings and everything. Um, so you are going to get see some like AMOLED ghosting uh, if you're scrolling around on an AMOLED screen, um, but I'm happy with that because that means that you are getting like the maximum battery savings and it's uh, it, it's not burning your eyes out by uh, because all the, the black pixels are literally not making light at all. There's a few different ways that you can toggle this. You can either, you know, tell the phone to always be in light mode, always be in dark mode, or you can have it turn dark mode on automatically when battery saver turns on, um, which is, you know, pretty cool. I've heard a lot of people talking about, like, how they would like to have the option to have it on turn on at sunset, which makes a heck of a lot of sense, right? We already have, like, the night shift where it um, shifts the entire screen kind of yellowish that can uh, activate at sunset. This would have been a no-brainer. Um I mean, me personally, I'm just going to have dark mode on all the time, so that's not a setting that I would have used. I will say that it does make it a little bit harder in dark mode to, like, tell the difference between notifications um, because there isn't, like, the the light-colored border, there's a slight border in between them, but it's not as much of a contrast to the dark background as what you get when you're in light mode and you've got a white background and then you've got uh, a dark, you know, little line in between each of the notifications. The contrast there in in light mode is much higher than in dark mode. So 
I have like found myself getting a little bit confused by like, oh wait, which which notification is this? And um, and also like if I'm using an app that has a really good dark mode, uh, and then a notification kind of pops down from the top of the screen. There have been a couple of times where I almost didn't notice the notification because it it just blends into the rest of the app, you know, all this all these dark backgrounds. So I think that would be a tweak that Google could make to improve this dark mode a little bit is just increase the contrast there around like the borders of notifications. Also, uh, <laughs> lots of Google's like own apps don't have a dark theme built into them yet. They promised that they were going to have dark themes built in like across the board, um, but still waiting on uh, on a lot of the apps that I use in my day-to-day -day life uh, to, to get those dark modes built in. They also brought a new like theming system in, uh, which is hidden behind the uh, developer options. Um, it, it lets you kind of like change the highlight color of like you know all of the quick settings um, toggles that are kind of grayed out when when they're off and then they in in default uh, I believe they turn like a, a blue uh, when they're on and you can change that blue color to one of like five options I was really looking when I heard about this uh, theming option I was like oh my gosh I'm gonna go change it to orange immediately because like dark background black background with orange highlights is like that is my ideal uh colors theme for an electronic device unfortunately orange is not one of the options so that's that's a shame all right let's talk about gesture navigation so this is something that google has been working on for a couple of years um it, indeed this was in direct response to uh, iOS when they when they released the iPhone 10 that didn't have a home button and they came up with this gesture system uh, for navigating around um, that's when Google I think started really like you know putting together their version of a gesture system and uh, it's really good now it's yeah the like I have been one of those pixel 3 users who was forced to use the half-baked like two button plus a couple of gestures system that they introduced last year with Android 9. I hated that system. Oh man. Um, but the new gesture system works really well. Um, it, uh, the, the animations feel very smooth and fluid. That was the main problem with the old gesture system. Um, but yeah, with this new system, you swipe up from, from the bar on the bottom to go home. Um, you swipe horizontally along it. Um, to the right to go to like you know to to switch between your most recently used apps um, and that list actually stays in the same order uh, until you have interacted with an app right so you can swipe multiple times to the right to go farther back in your list and then if you swipe left you'll go for like you'll go back in the list to where you were before which is really nifty um, and then also, so the back button is also gone now, um, and that is replaced by some uh, sliding in from the edges uh, on the left and right hand sides of the screen. Um, so that's not that's not down on the navigation bar anymore. That's like the entire left hand side of the screen and the entire right hand side of the screen are dedicated to the back gesture now. Now. The back gesture is definitely the weakest part of this gesture system for a couple of reasons. One, there isn't really an animation, like a nice smooth animation that's associated with that, right? On iOS, um, whenever you swipe in from, from the edge to go back, um, you, you see all of the content kind of slide with your finger uh, and it slides away to reveal the page that you're going back to. Um, but on Android, um, I think th this is a symptom of the fact that like the back system was programmed as a button for the entire existence of Android up until now. And so apps are never like listening for a, a partial back gesture right like you know if, if you, you could slide your finger part way and then slide it back if you don't you know if you change your mind and don't want to go back um 
But apps are never listening for that. They're just w listening for the operating system to say once, hey, go back. The user pushed the back button, go back now. Um, and so, yeah, the, the back gesture doesn't happen until you have lifted your finger off of the phone. So that's that's one way that it's a little bit weak. The other way that it's weak is that the fact that swiping in from the left edge of the screen now is a back gesture, um, that is how I usually open like the navigation drawers, like the menu drawers uh, in a lot of my apps, right? Um, usually they'll have a hamburger menu button way up in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. I'm not going to reach all the way up there with my thumb to hit that. So I just, you know, pull over that drawer from the edge of the screen. Um, it's pretty difficult to do that consistently now. Like the way that you do it is you kind of long like you press and hold for for a little bit um so it's a long press on the left edge of the screen and then that navigation drawer will kind of pop up and you can see it partially come over onto the screen and then you can pull that um in i think i would really prefer if google gave me the option to set the back gesture to only be the right hand edge of the screen um, because apps almost never use like the right hand edge of the screen as some sort of gesture to do something um, but the left hand side of the screen is quite often the you know a drawer of some kind um, this is definitely just gonna still be a problem until app developers stop using like that kind of motif for opening menus um, and, and you know so I, I think this is probably going to be the biggest push for app developers to start using like the um, you know having like four or five buttons down at the bottom of the app uh, to navigate around to different parts of the app uh, instead of like yeah having a drawer that you pull in to go to different parts of a menu. The other bad thing about the gesture navigation system right now is that it does not work with third-party launchers. Google is aware of the problem and they said that like during the last beta builds of uh, Android 10 they did announce that like oh yeah uh, this doesn't work with third-party launchers we're going to fix it it's not going to be ready in time for the initial release of Android 10. So this kind of makes me feel like you know pixel users are just kind of beta testers still, you know, even though I waited until the final release of Android 10, I still am getting a product that like, you know, they, they know that there's a problem with it and they are going to come out with a fix for that in the future. Um, but in the meantime, I just have to wait. And, and as a result, like because I use Action Launcher and I rely on a lot of its features for my day-to-day -day use, like I have switched back to using the three button navigation system instead of using this new gesture system i really like the gesture system i would use it on a daily basis but i just i can't because it it won't work with uh with my the launcher that i use now it is important to note here that they do now let me choose between the different navigation options right um for android 9 most users had the option of either using the traditional three button navigation system or the two button navigation system um, for Pixel 3 users, we didn't get a choice at all. We could only use the two button navigation system. So I'm really, really glad that I could get to go back to the three button system in the meantime. The share menu has gotten some love this uh, release. So one of the really long standing problems that Android users have had to deal with is the fact that, like, when you tap on the share button, it pops up with this sheet of, you know, a bunch of apps that you can share stuff to, and you'll, like, scroll for through it a little bit to find what you want, and then you're about to push the button to share it to Twitter or whatever, and then all of a sudden, everything will jump down by a line, and you'll hit the app that, you know, the, the one above the one that you wanted to do, and you, you now you got to back out of that app, and you have to go back to the share menu, yada, yada. That all happened because um, the the share menu uh, before Android 10, the share menu was being created every single time that you opened the share menu. So Android, the operating system, would go and query 
every single app that you have installed in order to figure out which ones could handle the type of content that you're sharing. Um, and in particular, there was a feature where apps could kind of make specific things within that app accessible to the share sheet. For, so for example, like a messaging app could give you access to specific contacts, right? So if I have a few people who I message in Hangouts a lot, those people, those individual people uh, might show up in my share sheet as like, oh, you want, you're sharing a link right now. Do you want to share it with this person who you talk to a lot? That's very useful, but those always took a little bit longer to appear in the share sheet than everything else. And so they would always jump up at, like, they would appear at the top, which bumps everything else down, and then, yeah, you know the rest. So the new share sheet, um, for the most part, everything appears right when the share sheet opens, you know. I, I think that Android ha is making a list of all of the apps and then keeping that list um, and not recompiling it every single time. Um, and also, the other way that they solved this problem is for those that those items that are um, direct links like into a specific part of the app, those now have their own row at the top that already appears there when you first open the share sheet. And those items might take a minute to actually like appear in that list. But because there's already a row there for them, they don't move everything down um, unexpectedly, right? The share sheet has also been uh, organized a little bit better. Um, so copy is almost always there right at the top. It's got its own row all dedicated to just copy whatever thing you just uh, shared, right? Um, because like that, honestly, that's the most commonly used item in the share sheet, I think, for most people. Um, then you get a row of recently shared apps, um, and then everything else is in alphabetical order. So it's no longer just random order. You have no idea where anything is going to be. You can actually, like, you know, you'll be able to find stuff fairly quickly. Um, I do think it would be nice to be able to, like, manually rearrange apps and maybe, like, remove items that you never, ever share stuff to. But Having an alphabetical list is almost as good. Notifications is another area that Google always improves every single uh, update to Android. Um, this time, the headline feature is that you get like contextual buttons in notifications. So it will detect content within the notification itself. And it will, if, if it detects something that Android can do some useful action on, it will give you a button straight to that thing. So for example, if it detects a link in there, um, it'll offer to just open the link in your default browser. If it detects a, an address, it'll offer to open that up in Google Maps, right? Stuff like that. Um, I, I'm pretty sure this sounds like it's probably building on like the smart text selection feature that they introduced a few versions ago because um, it detects a lot of this uh, similar types of things. Um, and for messaging apps, right, if you get get a message, it will sometimes give you smart reply suggestions. Um, for some apps, this will send that smart reply immediately. Uh, in others, it will like take that smart reply and then um, use that to, to start a message in like the reply field. And then you can edit it and you know add stuff to it. Um, but it's, it's impossible to know which apps are going to behave in which way because that's entirely up to the app developer. So that's a weird little thing. I've seen people complaining that these smart replies like feel weird to use in messages because like they use full like capitalization and punctuation and everything um which you know a lot of people say doesn't feel natural in text messages i don't know that's how i text anyway i always use proper capitalization and punctuation so i don't really mind i think it would be ideal if it like learned from each individual user's specific typing behavior, right? So it could match your style. Um, I don't think that it does that, though. I think that these are messages that it has learned based on a broad data set. 
I have noticed that notifications seem to be showing up in like a slightly different order than I remember them appearing in the past. So like the media playback notification, I'm used to that being always at the very top because it's like an app that is doing a thing for me right now. Um, but it's it's not always like sometimes sometimes I've gotten a notification and I open up the notification tray and then that notification is above the media playback one and then after like a little while I'll I'll watch it I can like see it jump down to be below the media playback um, notification so that's a little bit strange um, I think this is because of like there's there's a new kind of dichotomy where they sort out like priority and gentle notifications those are kind of the two large buckets that notifications fall into um and that distinction doesn't really give us any new features or any new ways to control notifications but it's kind of a simplified presentation to the user which is really really nice because like i i the, the old like android gives you a lot of different options when it comes to what you can do with notifications and how you can treat them and you know whether they are allowed to pop onto the screen whether they're allowed to make noise whether they are allowed to appear on the lock screen etc cetera, etc cetera, right um and we still have full control over all of that it's just that that is now kind of hidden one step back you can still get to it by going into the settings but it doesn't present itself right away what presents itself right away is just this very simple like oh is this a high priority notification or is this a gentle notification um, so i think that's a really good way for users who don't have the time uh, or energy to go into the settings and like really get granular with everything to just kind of you know tell the operating system whether they care about this thing like grabbing their attention right away or if they want to you know just have it leave them alone for a little while we have some new status bar icons um they they have like an outline now instead of just being like a kind of a light gray uh that fills in with solid um now it's got like you know it's just blank there's an outline of that shape and then that outline fills up with the particular thing. So like I'm, I'm talking about like the Wi-Fi, the cellular indicator and like the battery, right? Um, these new icons conform more closely to the Material Design 2.0 uh, design spec. Um, I don't really know how exactly I feel about them. Um, I'll get used to them. I do really like having the message uh, that the battery should last until 7 a.m. or whenever, you know. Um, that now appears in the notification drawer when you first pull it down instead of only being in the adaptive battery settings. Um, so that's, you know, bringing, bringing this really great feature and putting it more front and center so everybody can see it. Love that. Uh, if you use the snooze notifications feature a lot um initially i thought that that feature was gone because i couldn't i couldn't do it um but it's it's still there it's just that it's off by default in the settings now for some reason so you can go and turn that on for yourself media playback notifications now has a scrub bar uh at the bottom of the of that uh, media control little little panel um i really like that it's really cool and it works in almost every media app because like that is information that media apps were supposed to present to the uh operating system anyway um you know of how long is this piece of media how much time have i played through that piece of media already um i don't think that i'll be using that to like scrub back and forth a whole lot because like you know, if I'm listening to a podcast that's an hour long, like that, you know, a scrub bar that's that small isn't going to give me enough control to really, you know, go back and forth with confidence. Um, and also like, you know, when I'm listening to songs, like how often am I scrubbing to a specific spot in the song? 
but it is nice to have that progress displayed uh, instead of having to go like directly into the app to see that um, or relying on the app developers to like build some sort of visualization into their playback controls directly um, since this is supported across the operating system like they don't even need to worry about that um, I'll put a screenshot of what it looks like uh, in the show notes so go and check that out if you're if you're interested Speaking of media playback, um, I really like that the album art that's on the lock screen, right, um, that is like blurred out now, the the album art that's in the background. Um, I've always really liked having the album art, you know, appearing really large in the background of the lock screen, but like it does get a little bit distracting, you know, especially when you've got some album art where there's like a lot going on visually. Um, so just having it there, but like blurred out still gives you that kind of nice, like it, it changes the color so that you, you know, you're reminded like, oh yeah, that's what I'm listening to right now. Um, but not so much that it's super distracting. Also, there's some changes to how the always on screen treats like media playback it used to um just show a little icon for the notification the the media playback notification um but now that that icon goes away it doesn't appear in the notification uh the list of notifications that you have but you do get just like the te in the text area where sometimes a lock screen will show you like what your next upcoming um, calendar event is um, it'll now show you it'll tell you what's the name of the media that you're currently playing so that's pretty nifty focus mode so focus mode is a new feature that um, you go in uh, and you tell it like which apps do you have installed that make it difficult to stay focused right what what are the distracting apps that you have um and then you activate focus mode whenever you're like trying to get some work done uninterrupted and what will happen is kind of three different things one those notification or those apps won't be able to give you notifications you won't be able to open those apps at all and their icons will appear grayed out uh, on your home screen now I'm pretty sure that this is not strictly actually part of Android 10 because I'm pretty sure that I saw it pop up in my digital well-being uh, section of my settings before I updated to Android 10. Um, but it came out so close to Android 10 that I think everybody's talking about it as a feature of Android 10. Um, so yeah, we, we now have like quite a few different tools for limiting how we use our devices um so and and each of these tools like applies in a slightly different context in a slightly different way um so it is getting a little bit difficult to kind of keep track of them all um but you know just think about the different tools that you have and, and you'll be able to figure out like which ones you want to use um for for different purposes right because we've got do not disturb mode we have wind down mode we have app timers we have focus mode and we have parental controls so a little bit of work has been done on the app permissions front. Um, we now have more granular location permissions. So it used to be that you could only choose to give an app access to your location or deny that app access to your location. Uh, now you can choose either always give it access or only while the app is in use or deny it completely. So these are the same settings that iOS has had for location permissions for a very long time. Um, if you have given an app uh, permission to always access your location, a notification will pop up every once in a while um, telling you like, oh, hey, this particular app accessed your location in the background, um, just thought you should know. Um, and yeah, this is similar to uh, something that iOS does, but I think it's implemented a little bit better um, because what iOS will do is it'll just give you like a full, like it interrupts the entire screen and it says, hey, this app accessed your location and you can't do anything else with your phone until you've like dismissed that message. Um, whereas here on Android 10, it shows up as a notification. Um, so I do, I like that a lot better because it doesn't like my, my whole life doesn't have to stop just because, um, you know, 
Google Home accessed my location in the background. Ooh, scary. Um, the other app permissions are all pretty much the same as they were in the past, but they're a little bit easier to find because they're all kind of uh, organized in the same place in, in the system settings. I did notice that the permission manager like popped up when I first turned on the phone after updating to Android 10, um, and it asked if I still wanted to allow Pebble, uh, like the Pebble app, to access various different you know, permission things. And I, I think, I, I wonder if that's because like the Pebble app hasn't been updated in a long time. And so it's targeting an older version of Android. Um, and so they, I think they just wanted to like double check and make sure that I was aware that this app is still around and has, has permission to access stuff. Uh, there's a few new things in the privacy front. So um, apps can no longer access uh, various different unchangeable device identifiers, right? So um, like the IMEI number, the MAC address, stuff like that. Um, in order for apps to run in the background, they have to create a notification that the user can see. Um, I remember this, like they, they started kind of tweaking around with this kind of system um, a couple of years ago and things, you know, as things keep changing, I keep getting like persistent notifications that I really don't need to see. And like, it's always a different system, each version of Android to like figure out how I can continue to have this app running in the background without me having to see like an app notification icon up in my, uh, in my status bar all the time. Um, so I've, I've literally had to like turn off notifications from the Pebble app because there's just, I, do, I can't handle having that one always sitting up there. Um, a few apps that I have that are newer that, you know, continue to be updated um, do have persistent notifications that appear in like the silent notifications area of my notification drawer um, and they don't, like, their icons don't appear in the status bar. So that's good. I'm not sure why Pebble's notification isn't treated the same way. In order for apps to access network information, they also have to have the location permission because uh, network information can be used to kind of piece together what your location is, even if they don't explicitly have location permission. Um, there's an entirely new like privacy section in the settings. Um, right now it's pretty darn empty. Apparently in an earlier alpha build of Android 10, there was like a whole privacy dashboard that looked a lot like what digital well-being does for like, you know, the amount of time that you're, um, for, for your app time reports. So maybe that's still on its way. This, this you know, a, a more fully featured privacy section. We'll have to see, you know, maybe in a month, see what Google does. Uh, they've also changed the way that the clipboard is treated. Um, so now the only apps that can access your clipboard are one, the current keyboard that you have, that, that you're using, um, and two, whatever app is the currently focused app. So... I guess this means that I can't really use like the like the universal clipboard feature in join, I guess. I really I wish that there was like some sort of API for for apps to tie into if they want to mess around with the clipboard, you know, even while they're they're not the the main app that I'm currently using because those kinds of apps are very very powerful. Um and, you know, I, I understand like the security implications of allowing an app to always access my clipboard, but like honestly, I'm an adult, and if I think that an app isn't trustworthy, isn't going to like be good and use the the information that I give them, like then I'm I'm not gonna let them access that at all. So like, yeah. Emoji. We have uh, Emoji 12.0 is the version, the Unicode version of Emoji that uh, came out earlier this year. And um, and Android 10 uh, now has all of those. There's hundreds of new emoji, um, such as like the yawning face. And apparently there's like a finger pinching one that a lot of people like. Um, there's also gender neutral representations of many of the like action and occupation emoji, um, which is more in line with Unicode's like description of them. Um, 
most vendors, right, most uh, systems that have implemented um, those emoji have, you know, just kind of chosen a gender for each of those. Um, and a lot of them have been like pretty darn stereotypical. Um, but now, yeah, lo I love having these gender neutral representations. Um, and, you know, since Google already like went through the effort of making um, gendered versions of all of these different uh, emoji, uh, most of them now have like three different gender options in when you're in the emoji picker, um, but it defaults to the gender neutral one, which is freaking awesome. All right, now for some miscellaneous features that didn't really fit in anywhere else. Uh, there is a new emergency button in the power button menu. So when you long press the power button, in addition to like the shutdown, restart, screenshot options, you now also get an emergency button. And um, from what I've read is that tapping on that just brings you straight to the phone app and it'll dial 911. Um, I have not tested that because like that would be a bad idea. Um, but yeah, I'd like, I, I really, really like that because um, I don't know about you, but I don't make very many phone calls with my Android phone. Uh, and so like the dialer app, the phone app isn't even like it's not easily accessible from my dock right now. So just, yeah, making it as easy as possible for a user to directly call, you know, make an emergency call uh, is pretty crucial, honestly. Speaking of hardware buttons, we now have a new sound menu. Um, so when you hit the hardware buttons, it yeah automatically adjusts the media volume just like before. But then you can also pull up like the full menu with all of the different categories just by tapping on a button that's there right below the uh, the volume slider. Um, and instead of the, this menu now, instead of like taking you into the system settings app, you know, directly to the sound area, um, this menu just partially covers up whatever app you're currently in. And then once you're done with it, you know, you just dismiss it and you go back to the app that you were previously in. Um, so that's really, really cool. Also, in addition to like changing all the different volumes for the different categories of sounds that your phone might be making, um, you can also change like which physical device sound will play through, um, which I have found very useful because like I forget to turn off my Bluetooth headphones sometimes and I just have them like draped around my neck and uh, and then, you know, somebody calls me and I try to answer it and I'm like, why isn't this phone making any noise? Oh, right, because my headphones are making the noise. So, like, I can very quickly and easily change it to make sound through the phone itself without having to go and, like, turn off my Bluetooth device. Android Beam is now dead. Um, I'm bummed out about that. I don't think that many people will even notice, but like, man, I loved being able to just like blow people's minds by just like holding my phone up to, to the back of their phone and then like sending them, you know, a contacts information or something or just like sending an image or whatever. Um, I have heard that Google is going to be building in uh, a, a different kind of like wireless sharing, you know, short range sharing that doesn't require internet access kind of thing. Um, it hasn't come out yet to the best of my knowledge, um, but for now we still have the files by Google app available that can do that. But still, that requires everybody involved to have that same app already installed. And that's definitely like, you can't you can't assume that you can't rely on that as well as you can rely on like oh we both have android phones cool let's just tap them together and it works uh you can now connect to wi-fi networks just by scanning a qr code i really want to like print off some qr codes now and put them around my house uh just so you know so that people can just uh easily hook up to my guest network that way um I don't know what kind of information exactly, like how that QR code needs to be formatted, um, but that's a thing. Speaking of Wi-Fi, um, apps can no longer directly manipulate settings like Wi-Fi, um, but they can now pull up that particular setting for the user to adjust themselves. I don't think I've ever encountered an app trying to like turn on or off my Wi-Fi directly. Apparently like Chrome does that if it, if it detects like that 
you're not on the internet that you're not connected to the internet and um and then you know you can like push a button and have it turn on the internet um but uh yeah so now it now it has to pull up like a separate panel um from the settings app and the user has to explicitly go and do that so that's probably that's much better from a security perspective all right, to finish this off, we've got some under the hood stuff. So stuff that you probably wouldn't notice, uh, a little bit more technical, right? Um, but stuff that uh, I thought was interesting nevertheless. Uh, we now have support for foldable phones. Um, so device manufacturers will no longer have to go and like roll their own software implementations for how to treat like multiple different screens and have everything change and have app continuity and whatnot. Um, that's all built into Android. Woohoo. Support for 5G. Awesome. Um, Project Mainline. So this is addressing one of the big problems in the Android ecosystem, which is that, you know, it's really hard to get, like, device manufacturers to actually roll out system updates in a timely manner. Even though Project Treble makes that, like, super easy in theory, it's still, like, pulling teeth uh, trying to get device manufacturers to do that. Um so Project Mainline uh, takes lots of like security and privacy type things um, and like they have kind of reconfigured how they're structured in the operating system so that those items can now be delivered via the Play Store instead of via system updates um, so that lots of phones will be able to get those updates in a timely manner. Um, so think about like, you know, those monthly security updates that, uh, you know, t typically like I've a lot of times I've only seen pixel phones that actually have like, you know, a, a security update within the last three months or whatever. Um, it sounds like these updates will still be open sourced, right? They'll still be a part of the Android open source project. Um, but if you want to release a device that uses Google Play services, then you have to let Google control these security and privacy updates, right? Uh, there's some new split screen improvements. So many, many third party apps were coded incorrectly for split screen, um, and then they would uh, stop updating their user interface if they weren't like the last app that you tapped on. Um, so, for example, like if you had. Um, a messaging app open uh, side by side with like a document and you're like actively typing in the document the messaging app wouldn't like even if you're receiving new messages you wouldn't see those appearing on the screen as they come in until you tap on that messaging app again um, and that was you know that's entirely the fault of app developers like android was able to update you know like show you updates to multiple different uh apps um visually at the same time um but it relied on like you know developers it had something to do with like on pause and on restart and you know when those kinds of calls happen in at the operating system level or whatever um but they so they have improved things so that now multiple different uh apps can be uh, can have the on resume status instead of just one. So now, yeah, we shouldn't we we should see many fewer problems with split screen apps. There are some shenanigans going on with Android Auto right now. Uh, so before Android 10, Android Auto was just like an app that you installed from the Play Store, and if you had a f a car that had Android Auto built in then you would use it by like plugging into the the car and then that would command like the car would open up the android auto interface and your phone's screen i think would turn off and then you would just see everything being displayed on the um on on the car's dashboard right um but like all of like the software and everything was actually being run on your phone uh if you didn't have a fancy car like that, you could still use Android Auto by just launching the app, and then you would get like a smaller version of the Android Auto interface. And that's how I've been using Android Auto for years. I love that feature because like nobody who I know has a fancy new car. Um, they're changing things in Android 10, so now 
like there's the Android Auto interface is supposed to be controlled by the Google Assistant, but that's not ready quite yet. So we're we're again in this kind of weird limbo stage where like okay, the the new version of the operating system is out. Technically, you can't install Android Auto standalone on the new operating system, but the new version of Android Auto that's supposed to come out that relies on the Google Assistant isn't out yet. So like I'm lucky because I already had Android Auto installed. But if I didn't already have it installed, then I wouldn't be able to install it. And like, oh man, they're coming out apparently with like a a different, another standalone Android Auto app that is only for like the phone specific interface or whatever. But I think, I I don't think that that's come out yet. So it's, yeah, it's, it's all up in the air, um, being handled very, very badly. Um, and this is, this is pretty much peak Google right here. App bubbles. So... I'm sure you've seen app bubbles before, like chat heads in uh, in Facebook Messenger, uh, or if you were one of the cool cats who used the uh, Link Bubble um, browser back before it was bought by Brave. Um, that the this kind of this interface concept has been around for like five or more years, um, where like you you can have an app that's open that's on top of the app that you currently have open for real and you would just like minimize it and it would become a little just a little circle off to the side right um that th- those apps always relied on like the draw like the system draw over other apps permission in order to work and google is changing the way that those permissions work because like that presented a a big security problem right where um apps could entirely like completely take over your screen uh without you potentially without you realizing it um and uh and so they're they're coming up with an actual api that's for app bubbles specifically so that you can like have content from different apps open as different bubbles and everything and uh i don't know exactly how this is going to function like i've i I don't really like having everything just be like bubbles that are all over the place i we'll see how it goes yeah Something that I'm really, really excited for is dual boot functionality. So this lets you quickly flip between different builds of Android. Um, So the usage case that they've named is like, okay, next time that we have like, you know, a beta coming out, like, you know, we're we're previewing Android 11 next year, let's say. Um, And let's say that you want to try out the beta, but you only have one phone and you don't want to like, you know, completely... Get, like wipe the phone and you know risk everything by putting your main driver uh on a beta version of of android um what you can do is it you know it'll just partition your uh storage create a new installation of android alongside the one that you've got currently uh running and then uh you can just restart the phone into this uh this other version of android and try that out um which uh sounds pretty awesome i think that's probably how i'm going to be trying out like beta um versions of the next version of android um and and you know for the first time this is probably going to be like i'll be actively uh seeing what what the uh, development is like at each stage um, because i don't have to risk my device I think this should also allow people to install any other, by the way, this is only for builds of Android 10 or newer. It doesn't work with older version of Android for some reason. Um, But you you should be able to install any other build of Android that you want, including like third-party ROMs. Um, So I think I might be start trying out like third-party ROMs and stuff like that on my main phone uh, using this dual boot functionality. Scoped storage is a pretty significant change in how Android treats the file system. So previously, what would happen is each app, you would either give it, um, it would ask for permission to view like your files and photos and everything, um, and you could either give that permission or deny that permission. And that was it. Like if it had access to the file system, boom, it can access everything. Now, in Android 10, what what happens is 
each app gets their own little bucket in the file system and they can't access anything outside of that. Also, apps can write things to the media store collection, which is kind of a shared area of storage. Um, the downloads folder, for example, is in media store. Um, so all apps can write stuff to that area, but they cannot read any files that were created by other apps unless you give them the storage permission, right? Um, and so now the storage permission gives an app access to read everything that's in media store um, instead of giving them access to like the full file system, including all of like the system files and et cetera. Um, so even with the storage permission, they cannot edit or delete files that were created by other apps. They can just read them. Um, so in order to do that, in order to edit or delete other files, um, an app has to ask for permission to do that specifically. Now, this doesn't directly break um, file system apps, right? Um, you can still have a third-party file system app if you want to. Um, it's just that you have to go through a couple extra like permission steps um, at the beginning in order to give it access to like all of the files uh, that you want it to have access to. Now, because scoped storage is a new system that is, you know, can, can potentially break a lot of things for apps that aren't coded for it uh, directly. Um, it is optional right now for app developers. Um, even if they, even if those app developers like, you know, target the latest version of Android, uh, it doesn't, uh, it, it, they, they can turn off uh, scope storage if they want to. Um, but in Android 11 next year, it will be mandatory most likely uh, for, for every app. Um, and so, that has the potential to break a lot of older apps uh, that haven't been updated to to use um, yeah this this new scoped storage system. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Also of note is that um, accessing like GPS coordinates in media, so like if you take photos right and then your camera uh, stores the GPS location uh, for the, for each of those photos. Um, apps now have to ask per for permission to view that GPS coordinates. But when I say ask permission, I don't mean ask the user. It just asks the operating system for permission to view that. And the operating system always grants that permission um, without consulting the user. So I'm not entirely sure why Google is doing this. They must be doing some research to figure out like, okay, how often do apps actually want to access these GPS coordinates and, you know, trying to figure out if it's worth uh, allowing the user to like, you know, give permission or not give permission for that kind of thing. The biometric API now supports things besides fingerprint sensors. So facial recognition is something that uh, can can be more widely supported uh, by by more device manufacturers who don't have the resources to go and uh, roll their own solutions. The operating system will now warn the user if they are running an app that targets uh, an old version of Android. I think I think it's like four years old or more. Um, then, uh, then it'll pop up with a warning. And this isn't the kind of warning where it's like, oh man, we're switching to 64-bit and this app is like built for 32-bit and you better update it, otherwise it won't run like in the next version of Android. No, I think they're just trying to like, you know, kind of give the user a heads up that like, okay, this is using pretty old APIs. It might not work the way that you expect it to uh, on this newer version of Android. Um, I've, I've only seen that pop up for me with the Pebble app. Um, so, oof, uh, it's making me a little bit nervous. Rebel folks, we need to get on that and like, you know, get that app uh, updated to use, uh, target the newest version of Android. But yeah, that takes a lot of, a lot of resources. There is also a new encryption method. Um, this is really exciting. So this uh, allows devices with really old chipsets to encrypt your storage without significantly impacting performance because up until now um, you know in order for a phone to be able to uh, encrypt everything and not have it you know slow down incredibly uh, you had to have a chip that uh, is from arm version 8 
or newer. I think it is. Uh, and uh, and they came up with a software solution. There's they now have a technique for encryption to be done on uh, low powered devices, older devices. Um, so now encryption will be required for all devices that ship with Android 10. So that's very exciting. And finally, we've got a few features that uh, were promised as part of Android 10 but aren't quite ready yet. Um, they're going to be coming later this fall. Um, obviously, we have the gesture navigation fix for third-party apps, um, but also live captioning. That's going to be awesome. So this will give you on-screen captions for any audio that the phone is playing, no matter what source it's coming from, right? It could be from a YouTube video. It could be from your podcast player, whatever. Um, it'll give you captions for whatever you're listening to. Um, and this is going to be a really good complement to live transcribe which is a feature that is already out um, and live transcribe gives you captions for anything that the microphone hears um, which can definitely help uh, if you like are a little bit hard of hearing and you're in a loud environment or something like that right um, it's like those two uh, features together um, really like improve the accessibility factor of the android operating system Thanks for listening to this episode of Second Opinion. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. Second Opinion Reviews is released under a Creative Commons Attribution License, so feel free to use any part of this episode as you see fit, as long as you link back to the original page, which, again, is thenexus.tv slash SO73. If you want to discuss this episode, discuss uh, Android 10 with, uh, with me or with any of the other listeners, uh, please go to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And uh, if you are willing and able to support the Nexus financially as we continue to make tech-focused podcasts, you can uh, find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the nexus tv come back in two weeks to hear ryan rampersad reviewing his new samsung galaxy note 10 plus and until then have a good one the nexus the nexus the nexus tv podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence, convergence. Technology is ever-evolving. It touches every part of our lives, both influencing and being influenced by society. I'm Ian Arbuck, and I know it's hard to stay on top of everything you need to know to live in this digital world. That's why, every month on The Extra Dimension, we explore a different aspect of the technological convergence. Find it on our website, thenexus.tv, or by searching for The Extra Dimension in your favorite podcast player.